Happy Father's Day to you all. We have such great dads here at Grace, and I hope it's a very special day for you all. If you're with us uh, for the first time or haven't been here for a while, a very, very warm welcome to you. And we have a, a packet that tells about uh, Grace Church, and there's a connect card and a pen that you can fill out and put in one of the boxes at the back of the sanctuary. If you'd like to just begin to be part of the church family here, we would love that. Would anybody like one of the ushers to bring to you one of those welcome packets this morning? Okay. We also want to make sure that everybody has a copy of our notes as we continue our study of First Peter this morning. We want to make sure. And so if you need a copy, the elders or the ushers will bring those to you where you're seated. Anybody need a copy of the, our notes this morning? Okay, great. We're well served. Always on the bottom of the second page, we draw your attention to uh, opportunities to be involved in uh, the ministries and the family life here at Grace Church. And I hope it is a, a special day uh, for you men uh, as you celebrate this day set aside for fathers. Um, I know for myself, I'm looking forward to a fresh boysenberry pie that my dear wife has baked. Um, we're enjoying uh, just a wonderful harvest of boysenberries this year, their very first year. And so she's blessed me uh, this week by making, I don't know how many jars of jam and boysenberry syrup. And then we had a pie the other night and a pie today for Father's Day. So I'm not going to be suffering at all. We're going to be uh, at the home of our son and daughter-in-law, Caleb and Liz, with our grandkids, Ellie and Josh, and our daughter, Anna, and her husband, Jose. And uh, Caleb is uh, cooking the meat. And so uh, I love you vegetarians out there, but I'm going to be having a good piece of meat today <laughs> for Father's Day dinner. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, they're, they're out in Vista. Actually, they live just down the road here at Jim Lane. So, but I hope it's a special day for you, you as well. But I can say this to you, that the greatest joy is going to be sitting at table surrounded by my family. I mean, boysenberry pie or no, steak or no, to be there with my wife and our children and our grandchildren is the greatest joy. And I would say it's the greatest joy this side of heaven. And uh, I know many of you feel that same way. Um, so I'm getting older, so I get teary now when we're, ever, we're together as a family. And my, I'm sure my kids just roll their eyes and say, this, this guy needs to be put away. <laughs> so... He's leaving Zoomies around the house. I, he doesn't even know what they are. But I think that deep joy that a father feels when he's with his family is a, a, a small microcosm of God and his relationship with us. And how deeply and longingly God desires to be with us. And we see that when we open the very first pages of the scriptures. We see that in Genesis 1, where God brings order out of the chaos. The world was formless and void, and he brings order. And he creates a place where he can dwell on earth with his new family, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And through whom then he can partner with to spread his dwelling place on earth as they exercise dominion and subdue the earth and as they have children and, and as his family grows. And that's God's desire was for them. He didn't need them, but he created Adam and Eve because he wanted a relationship with them. And we know this because of the description how he walked with them in the garden in the cool of the evening. That's what you do when you really love being with somebody. But we know that then the fall was a tragedy that for a time um, destroyed God's plan. But we know that 
God is persistent and he is going someday to restore Eden and paradise in the new heaven and the new earth where he will dwell with us without anything between us ever again. But the fall took place. Man has been estranged from God ever since. But God still desires to dwell with men and and that's then expressed when he chooses the descendants of Abraham to be his nation, his special possession, his chosen people, to make himself known to the other nations of the earth. And having liberated them from slavery in Egypt, what did God direct them to do through the, the law and the covenant that he made with them? And that is to build what? The tabernacle. To what end? that he might dwell with them. That he would dwell in the center of their camp and whenever they looked to the center of the camp during the day, they could see the cloud and at night they could see the fire and know that God was with them and God was near. And then they could go to the tabernacle itself and bring their sacrifices and their offerings and come close to the very presence of God, which is what God wanted. God wants us. God loves us. God desires to be with us. But then as we know, we, we look at the story of Israel and God is faithful to his covenant promises. He brings them into the land of promise. He settles them there. But then we have the 400 years of the judges where every man did what was right in his own eyes. Where they went after the, the gods, the Baals. They went after the, the gods of the nations around them. It wasn't that they rejected Yahweh, but it They were not exclusive in their worship and service to just Yahweh, but to these other gods. And eventually, as you read the historical record in the Old Testament, the tabernacle just kind of goes out of the picture. It's it it becomes obsolete. It's no longer at the center of the Israelites lives, even though it's the place where God dwells among them. Again, we see. We see human unfaithfulness, not God. Then God in his grace raises up a young shepherd boy named David to be the king. And David loves the Lord with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he leads the nation in spiritual reformation. He intends to to build the temple, but God says, no, that's going to be your son Solomon. But you can prepare everything. Solomon builds then what became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, this magnificent temple worthy of Yahweh. And the amazing thing is that in God comes to Solomon on the occasion of the temple's dedication, and he says, I will dwell in this temple that you've made for me. And so God dwells in the midst of his people once again. His desire is to be with us, to be with his people whom he loves. But then as we know that their hearts too became cold towards God and the kingdom separated into the northern kingdom and it slumped into calf worship and the worship of the Baals and finally God punished them as he promised them in Deuteronomy and they were expelled, they were exiled from their land by the Assyrians and they experienced the beginning of the diaspora where they were forcefully ejected from the land. And then the southern tribe, as you know, lasted about 150 years, but they too turned from Yahweh. And one of the saddest places in all of the Old Testament is when Ezekiel describes the glory of the Lord leaving the Solomonic Temple. And God left the presence of his people because of their apostasy and their rebellion and their wickedness. And he too then sent the Babylonians to punish them and to drive them out of the land, to expel them out of the land. And they too then went out in the diaspora where they were living among foreigners. They were foreigners living among foreigners in the Babylonian empire, but they were also separated from God. See, God never never willingly separates himself from us. We're the ones who separate ourselves from God, but it's God's desire always to be with us, to be with his family. The good news as we look forward through the prophets is 
in the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a magnificent temple that's rebuilt. And God will dwell with man here on the earth. But before that time, God, through revelation to his prophets, revealed that part of his salvation plan through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, part of his plan of salvation is that he is going to create a new temple, a place where he can dwell here on the earth once again in the midst of his family. But when you read the prophetic material, it's like those puzzle pieces we talked about several weeks ago. The revelation that was given to the Old Testament prophets, they didn't understand. And you'll see that as we read some of these puzzle pieces of these prophecies about the new building that God is going to bring about, it's not real clear in the prophecy itself. It's not real clear. It's cryptic. And so this morning, I want to take you there into, the, into these puzzle pieces about, about God's intent to, to build a new building, to build a new temple. And that's the title of our, of our study this morning. But let's look together at Isaiah chapter, and this print got smaller since yesterday. <laughs> Let me put on my glasses so I can read this with you. So Isaiah 28 verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, this is to Isaiah in the 7th and 8th century BC. Behold, I am the one who is laid as a foundation in Zion. A stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. Well, that doesn't give us a whole lot of information other than this idea of a cornerstone that God is going to lay in Zion. Then in Psalm 118, 22, we have this prophecy. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So this still is dealing with the concept of the cornerstone, but that it's going to be rejected by someone. And then in Isaiah 8, 14, and he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then the Lord Jesus himself makes reference to the prophecy in Isaiah 28. He has just had a confrontation with the uh, spiritual leaders of Israel. And Jesus said to them in verse 42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And so what the Lord Jesus now does with the cornerstone concept is he, he puts it together that there's going to be a massive change, and that is God is going to take away the kingdom from Israel for a time, and he's going to give it to another people who will bear its fruits. And it's all over the rejection of the cornerstone because they have rejected, the spiritual leadership of Israel has rejected the cornerstone. So we have these, at least these four puzzle pieces that have to do with this idea of a cornerstone a stone of offense, a stumbling is going to be rejected by somebody. And then it's, it's going to be related to a shift in God's program away from the nation of Israel and to another people. So what we see then is that Peter and probably the other apostles also through the work of the Holy Spirit illuminating their minds to understand, he puts these pieces together for us. And it begins in an interesting place in Acts chapter 4. And what we're going to read takes place after Peter and John have, through the power of the risen Christ, healed a man who was crippled 
uh, who was well known uh, and would would seek alms there in the temple compound. And so this was a very public miracle. And as a result, then a crowd gathers around Peter and John. And what do they do? They tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth. They tell of his crucifixion. They tell of his resurrection. And the powers that be did not like that. And they warned them. And they told them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Well, Peter and John just weren't going to obey that. And so the next day they are there in the temple compound. And once again, they're preaching Christ. And it leads to a confrontation with the spiritual leaders that we pick up in verse 5 of Acts 4. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this, the miracle of healing the cripple? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. Do you see how Peter has put it together? And so he recognizes the fulfillment of that prophecy that these rulers, these spiritual rulers who have led the nation to reject Jesus of Nazareth and his claim to be the promised Messiah. And he's saying, you are the builders. You are the ones who fulfilled that prophecy. You are the builders who have rejected this cornerstone. And then he identifies clearly who the cornerstone is. Who is the cornerstone? Jesus. And so Peter is putting these puzzle pieces together. And then he goes on and he completes his thought here. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But there's more to these puzzle pieces. There's more that the prophets, that God was using the prophets to reveal about this cornerstone. And this comes out in our text in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. Now remember, Peter is writing to Jews and Gentiles who have been expelled out of Rome. And they have been forcefully resettled in Asia, and Asia Minor rather. And the eastern portion of that region, which was very isolated, had a variety of different disparate people groups, among whom these Jewish and Gentile Christians were not wanted, were not welcomed. And so they are experiencing hostility. They are experiencing shame at the hands of these people who are uh, uh, against them and against their, their religion that pits them against uh, the host uh, religion and their ethics and practices. And so Peter is writing to these Jews and Gentiles who are suffering for being followers of Christ. And he says to them, as you come to him, and the him is Jesus. This is referring to their coming to Jesus by faith. And they're trusting in him as the risen Savior. As you come to him. And then he describes Jesus uh, in several different ways. A living stone. And so Jesus is a living stone. Why? Because he is resurrected from the dead. He is alive. He is not dead. He is a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now, I want to stop here because that phrase is, is really a good one for us to absorb. He's referring to Jesus. We saw where he was rejected, right? By the, in Acts chapter 4, he was rejected by the 
the high priests and the spiritual leaders, political leaders of Israel. He was rejected by men. But in the sight of God, he's chosen and precious. Now, this is a theme throughout Peter. We've already seen it, that as we see in the life of Jesus, Jesus really, his life experience is a framework for the Christian life. And as we've already seen, it was foretold that the Messiah would suffer. Remember, that was one thing that the prophets did understand, that this one that that the Holy Spirit had revealed to them, the Spirit of Christ in them, that he would suffer and then he would be glorified. And that's the way of it. And we see it again here. He is rejected, but then he will be exalted. And the, and the, and the touch point or the connect point with believers, including ourselves, is that is very much and many times the way of the Christian life where there is suffering. We are, we're suffering because we live in a world that is at war against God and against his people. And so there is suffering, but that will be followed by glory when we are with him. There is rejection. They are experiencing rejection in all the various places where they are living and people don't want them there, just as Jesus was rejected. But then they are chosen and precious. We've seen that, and Peter has gushed about that in the first chapter, in the second chapter, about All that God has done for them and how they are a chosen people. They have been brought into a covenant relationship by the Holy Spirit. They have this incredible inheritance awaiting them. And then there are more graces that are going to be revealed when Jesus Christ comes again. So right now they're rejected by men. But just like the Lord Jesus, they're chosen and precious in God's sight. Now he goes on. And he says in verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, like the Lord Jesus, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And here, now he begins to put other these puzzle pieces together. He doesn't use the term temple, but... Um, Where do priests serve? Where do priests serve? They serve in temples. And what is a core duty or service that priests render to both man and God? They bring sacrifices. God's people bring their sacrifices, whether it's a sin offering or a consecration offering or a thanksgiving offering. And they give it to the priests and the priests who have been trained in the Torah and in, and in how to offer those animal sacrifices, then take that animal and they deal with it exactly as God has required in Leviticus, for instance, where it tells them exactly how to, how to process the animal, how to drain its blood and catch it, how to then take the animal and butcher it in such a way that you are separating the meat from the other parts of the animal and what parts of the animal you put on the altar, what parts of the animal then you take outside of the camp. And so the priests in the tabernacle and in the Jerusalem temple, they would offer these animal sacrifices in a way that was acceptable to God. And so Peter is drawing the parallel that we as believers, his readers as believers, are one living stones. In other words, they are the ones who make up this new building. And in addition to that, they are priests who serve in this new building. They are all priests and they are to render to God Spiritual sacrifices, no longer animal sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But then he goes on and he quotes Isaiah in verse six. He says, for it stands in scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. 
a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And here is what I want us to, to understand. Why does he quote that? What does that have to do with the fact that believers are now living stones? They're in a new house. They're priests who offer sacrifices. Because what he is putting together for us is that what God was revealing through the Old Testament prophets was that when Messiah comes, he is going to build a new temple. He is going to build a new temple. What's the purpose of a cornerstone? What do you need to build in order to build a building made of stone? What do you need? And you need a cornerstone off of which then to build that new building. And so what the Lord was revealing through the Old Testament prophets was all along, it was God's intent to build a new building, a new temple. But this temple would be built not on a, a stone, a hard stone, but this temple would be built off of the cornerstone of whom? Jesus Christ. And so what he is saying is that God now through Jesus Christ is building a new temple. And that temple is the church. You are the living stones of God's temple. And who dwells in the temple? God himself. And so all along through the prophets, God was revealing that he's going to build a new temple. That it would replace the old temple in Jerusalem, by the way, which was destroyed in 70 AD. But that God would once again dwell with his people here on the earth through his new temple. And that temple is the church. And Jesus is the cornerstone of this new temple. He's the cornerstone of the church. And you then are the living stones. And the church will continue to be built until the very last believer before the rapture. And so it is our privilege. Notice what he says next. He says in verse 7, So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And he talked about shame, didn't he, at the end of when he quoted Isaiah 28. That those who don't believe in him will be put to shame. You see, that's what happened to the high priest. That's what happened to all the spiritual and political leaders in Israel. They supposedly were the men of God. They were supposedly the ones who were experts in God's word. They were the ones who supposedly were the teachers of the untaught. That if you wanted to know God, these were the people that you would come to. But they, they have shame all over themselves because they totally missed it. They are totally out of step with God. They have rejected the one that God has provided as a cornerstone. And so they are covered in shame. Whereas for these who are suffering and rejected by their host people, he says to them, verse 7, So the honor is for you who believe. Well, what honor has God bestowed on these believers? He's bestowed on them the honor of being living stones of this new building and then being priests who serve. In this new temple in which God dwells. This is an amazing thing. That's why he quotes and he emphasizes the cornerstone. The cornerstone is Jesus and the cornerstone is the cornerstone of a new temple. And that temple is the church. God now dwells on earth in the church. He goes on then in verse 8, that is, this cornerstone, the Lord Jesus, is also a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do, but you are a chosen race. And see, he draws the parallel spiritually between the nation of Israel 
and now the people of God, the church. He says, you're a chosen race. Well, who was a chosen race before them? Yeah, Israel. You're a royal priesthood. Who had the royal priesthood before them? The Jews. He says, you're a holy nation. Who is a holy nation that is set apart to God? Dedicated to God, the Jews, nation of Israel. A people for his own possession. That was Israel, and now it's the church. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And see, that's one of the core priestly duties and privileges that we have as the priests in this new temple that's built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ is to declare the excellencies, proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He goes on in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so, again, as we've seen Peter throughout all of this, writing to a persecuted group of believers, there's no pity party here. <laughs> there's no pity party at all. He is showing them the honor that God has bestowed upon them for their faith in Christ to make them living stones and priests in now the dwelling place of God on the earth with men. And so here's the, the upshot of what he is revealing, and that is that Jesus is the cornerstone of a new temple, and that new temple is the church. We are, you are, the temple of God. God dwells in you. In the person of his Holy Spirit. We are where God dwells on the earth. The church. You are that new temple. You are the fulfillment of those prophecies that we have read this morning. You are the new temple and the cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. You are living stones and you are priests. And as priests, it's your responsibility to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ and also to proclaim the excellencies of the one who has brought you out of darkness into the light. And so here are some of our priestly responsibilities and service. First of all, I think it is to teach and to obey the word of God. That's what should be at our very core. Second, it is that we are to sing in the sense of this singing represents worship. And worship isn't limited to singing. I'm not making that point. But definitely in the tabernacle and the temple, there was much music. And that music is to be centered on the glories of God, to proclaim his excellencies. And, and through music is one of the wonderful ways that we do that, that really touches the human heart. And so all of our singing should lift up and praise God, the Father, and praise God, the Son, for who they are, what they have done, and what they're going to do. And that is our priestly responsibility and our priestly privilege to offer that to God. Then we are to be people who pray and bring our prayers to God the Father, to praise Him, to worship Him, to express our gratitude for all the ways that, for who He is, for what He's done, what He's going to do, how He's provided for us, how He's delivered us from the troubles of life to bring in intercessory prayer the needs of our brothers and sisters and the needs of those who are not yet saved. Our priestly service involves our serving according to our spiritual gifts. Our priestly service involves what we learned about last week is right at the center of our community, of the new covenant community, and that is that we love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That's offering, when we do that, when we love one another, we are offering a sacrifice that is acceptable to God in Christ Jesus. And then certainly one of our priestly privileges and duties is to share the story of Jesus with those who are not yet reconciled with God the Father. That they too might enter in and be part of this family. That they too might become living stones. That they too might join us in the priesthood and the privileges that we have of serving in God's dwelling place. 
And I would encourage you, if, if you're still meeting with uh, your home groups, as some of us have taken a break for the summer, but or in your other gatherings where you're studying the scriptures, but to think through the implication. So, I mean, it's really something that God revealed hundreds of years before the coming of Jesus. He revealed through the prophets that this coming one, the Messiah, would be the cornerstone of a new temple. That's no small thing. That's massive. And it reveals that God was going to, to build a new temple, that he, there was a shift in his program from the Jerusalem temple. He's going to build a new temple. And in this new temple is where he is going to dwell with his family here on the earth. And that's you. And to really absorb that, not as, oh, well, gosh, that's, that's kind of a, like a, a, it's a warm, fuzzy idea. It's not an idea, it's a reality. It's who you are. It's who God has made us. We are his dwelling place on earth. The Holy Spirit of God, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And so I think there's some things there maybe to, to think about in terms of the implications of that. But here's, here's one that I, I, I would share with you. And it's one that we're not, I, I'm not used to thinking in these terms. But you know, in the Old Testament, there is a, a reality called holy ground. So, <laughs> particularly for an ancient Israelite, or the ancient Israelites, the world was really a very dark, hard place. And so the safe places for them are the places where God dwells. Where God is, there is light and life. Where God is absent, there is darkness and death. And so there are, there's this reality in the Old Testament that they, there, are, there are places that, because of God's presence, become holy ground. That ground, literally where that ground is, is set apart to God. And here's an illustration that many of you will remember. What did the angel of the Lord say to Moses from the burning bush when Moses approached the burning bush? What did he tell him to do? Take off your sandals. Why? Yeah, and what made that ground holy? The presence of Yahweh. And so as you move through that, the tabernacle area was holy ground. And by extension, the, the encampment as people lived in loving obedience to Yahweh, the entire encampment of the Israelites was holy ground. When you came into the encampment of the Israelites, you came into the presence of Yahweh, which you were coming into the presence of life and light. And you were coming out from the wilderness, which was a place of darkness and death. And what I want to submit to you through this teaching for us to consider is if we are the temple, if we are the temple of God in which where he dwells, chooses where he dwells during this age, then one of the implications is that when we gather together as a church, family, then Yahweh, God is here. And this is holy ground. Where you are this morning is holy ground. When you gather with your home groups, with fellow brothers and sisters who are living stones of this new temple, priests in this new temple, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, God dwelling in you, then that place where you meet together as a, as a home group is holy ground. It's set apart. 
And I think how that can change our thinking is that like when we come together to worship like this, we're not just coming to, to stand or sit in the midst of a whole bunch of other people to sing and to pray, to enjoy a video, to endure Paul's teaching until we can go out. And when we come together, we are constituting holy ground because Yahweh it, through his spirit is here dwelling in our midst. We're that new temple. This is where God dwells in us. And there's more than to explode, explore also how individually we know that God dwells in us through his Holy Spirit, through his indwelling. And what are the implications there? But this is a profound teaching. It's not, it's not a slogan. It's not a, it's not a fictional. This is a reality. God is telling us, God is revealing to us today that you are living stones in a new building that he has built on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. You are where he dwells today on the earth. What a profound thought. And then that transforms our service. We're serving as priests who are bringing to God sacrifices that are acceptable through Christ Jesus. That's who you are. May the Holy Spirit help us to understand this. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this portion of your word. These are profound things that we are that we are thinking about. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who brings understanding into your word and its application to our lives. I thank you for the privilege of being a part of this part of the temple here in Ramona with my beloved church family. And I thank you how so many of my brothers and sisters live out their priestly responsibilities and duty so well with joy, with love, with uh, genuineness and a sincere love for you. Help us to become ever more a dwelling place in which you and the Lord Jesus are glorified and lifted up. And a place where others who are not yet reconciled to you might hear the story of Jesus and come to faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. And become part of this new temple, the church. I pray these things in Jesus' name, the cornerstone. Amen.